Hi everyone, welcome to Outlier TV. I'm your host Georgie Speakman and this evening we have the pleasure of having the beautiful Kath Turner, aka Turner Scope in the studio tonight. How are you babe? Thanks for well, coming. Thank you Georgie, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm really well, thank you. We were, we've were we just had some fun setting up, haven't we? It's one of those very <laughs> compact areas where everything just needs to be just right, but I think we've nailed it. We've got Miosha in the studio, we've got Kyla on sound, everyone's rocking and rolling, cookies by your feet. I mean, Licking your toes you as, as we speak. Not distracting at all. <laughs> um, thanks so much for, for coming here this eve. I really, really appreciate it. You're recently new to LA, aren't you? I am. Two months ago Welcome. I arrived from London and every day, I know it's cliche, I fall in love with the city a little bit more. Awesome. High five to that. Yay. I've been here, what, I've just over five years and I still I still feel that way about the city every single day, yeah. which is really awesome. But as you can tell everyone, she's Australian. Um, Kath, for those who are not familiar with her already, she is a journalist, current freelance journalist and producer, and she's had a long-standing career as a foreign correspondent for a good 20 years, right? Yeah, my God, when you say that. But oh she's still God. only 15. You was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're filling out your credit card, uh, your date of birth on forms, and you're just like scrolling to like the back of the <laughs> BC 22. And you're like, actually, my year's missing. <laughs> yeah. You just only got a 1985. Yeah. <laughs> so 20 years in the biz, though. That's yeah, fantastic. And you've time. lived in, obviously, Australia, but you were born and raised in... Born and raised in Vietnam. Moved to Australia when I was five months. Yeah. Then my career... Then I've just... I worked out the other day before I moved that I have moved to 26 different... Places. God, now I was only going to rattle off New York, London, DC. They're the international ones. So I don't know but how otherwise the audience is. Like yeah. In Australia, I am bounced around Everywhere. between maybe 10, 12 cities, 15 maybe. Incredible. So yeah. so, so why LA? Lot. With this dynamic career that you've had, why? what has brought you to LA? Number one, the sunshine. Mm -hmm. I lived in London for two years and it, the winter nearly broke me. Yeah. And I did New York for six or seven years. And those winters, I thought then nearly broke me. Uh, so I've, as you get, as I got older, just realized that it's important for me to feel comfortable. And because of my job a lot of the time was to report on the weather, I was outside in the elements in London, in the cold, just freezing my, what's left of my titties left, and then just going, <laughs> why am I doing this Who to myself? Titties? Who needs them anyway? So <laughs> LA was obviously, you know, and it's very, it's near the ocean. Um, I have a lot of, friends here uh, and colleagues and it just felt like a calling I'm yeah. uh, again cliche but it's and since the day I landed I've just had this I've exhaled and gone right this is exactly where I'm supposed to be and where I want to be I am very curious to know between the cities and countries that you have relocated and lived between how you have um, uncovered found discovered evolved the personal and professional identities of mm. yourself and how that's, how that's differed between each place. Who was the Australian Kath versus the London Kath versus the New York Kath? And then, yeah. of course, how, what are you hoping the LA Kath to look, feel and be like? Well, it's fascinating when you put it like that because each city, you're right, brings out something different in you depending on where you're at in yeah. your life. So I can honestly look back on Australia and I was in a, a long-term, long-distance relationship um, and I was quite conservative. I didn't party, I didn't, you know, go out hard, I wasn't doing anything crazy. I concentrated on my career. Um, so I just worked good up sort of, as a yeah, journalist. I did the complete bloody opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then when I went overseas, I was like, oh my God, I'm out of jail. And I went a yeah, little yeah. bit crazy. Yeah. So the first move was to KL. Um, and that was my first, quite, expat yeah, ex quite, yeah. Yeah, my first expat experience. And I just kind of discovered um, freedom, I guess, and just kind of came out of not my shell, but I certainly became someone else enjoying um, travel, enjoying being a well paid expat, uh, enjoying being in a country where English is not the first language. Um, I started with Al Jazeera English there, so everybody had moved to KL to be part of an exciting launch of a major international network. Yes. So it was a very shared experience. And I just Fantastic. discovered things that I liked. I liked drinking, I liked partying, I liked dancing. I had Honestly, never done really any of that stuff in and Sydney. Any of the Asian-related countries and all, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, and uh, renowned for the Aussies for you know going a little yeah. bit bananas. So you could probably get a, away right. with it there. Yeah, and you know what I also got away with um, because I was in good company. <laughs> Do we really want to know? Was um, the Asian alcohol flush? You know, when you drink too much and Asians get red faces, everyone around me was having it as well. So I was just spending. 
proud. Well, you know, you just look like you had some rosy cheeks. That's from true. the beautiful right. humidity. Apart from the 75 degree temperature. <laughs> um, so that was an amazing experience. And the travel. Yeah. I honestly, you know, it's a, it's a two hours to everywhere amazing. Hong Kong, Vietnam, Thailand. Um, and so I really just kind of, not a rebirth, but it was more just like a emerging from behind the yes, curtains. Yes, yes. And then from there I went to D.C., Washington, mm. D.C. Um, God, that would have been quite the par- like dichotomy. Yeah. And it was I, before I, I, got, I got a job, I got promoted to a producer reporter for Al Jazeera English. And before I left, I started, I bought um, Jennifer Lopez's um, uh, DVD and I was watching all her videos yes. of her dancing in the club <laughs> and I'm like oh yeah girl this is gonna be me I and have I, a story about that too, <laughs> I'll say. keep going I arrived in DC and I was like is this real life everything was like I was on a movie set I went to the White House I stood outside all That's the incredible. major buildings yeah. I was like I've arrived in America, it was my first. Who time. was in power then? Was it Obama? It was, was before uh, the, his. No, time. it was George Bush, but okay. it was the election of um, McCain, McCain against Obama. Right, and incredible. I was, you know, promoted, and I was sent there to cover it. And I'd never, never been in America before. And I actually used that in my interview as a selling point: fresh eyes, new perspectives, Absolutely. not jaded. Right, right, right. Um, and so, and that me was very. I rediscovered journalism again because Kale was a producer, not on camera. So DC, I was like, oh, geez, do I remember how to do a piece to camera? Do I remember how to interview people? Wow, yeah. And then I just landed. And, you know, Americans are so easy to interview. They are. They're so articulate. They've only had Aussies on. (laughs) They're so articulate, so engaging, such great vocabulary. And I was like, and I could just feel myself, like, puffing up and going, oh, my God, i got a little bit of fun going on here. (laughs) Like, I was really enjoying it. That's nice. That's good. Um, Like you said, fresh fresh energy, fresh blood to give a completely new perspective and... Yeah. vibe to everything that you were reporting on at that and it time. And was such an exciting time to be there. Absolutely. Obama was electrifying. Yeah. You know, I followed yeah. McCain a lot on mm-hmm. his thing. But then, and then a year later, I got promoted again to go to New York. Mm-hmm. And that's when it really went a little bit nuts. So, um, In what way? How, I mean, aside from perhaps some of the things and stories, events that you had to report, and yeah. we will we'll get to that. And I would like to circle back on the White House experience um, perhaps a little bit later. But yeah, the from the KL the, to DC to the yeah. New York. New York is uh, persona. The intensity is hard to describe. She's now schizophrenic, but that's <laughs> <laughs> now addicted to a multiple drug, um, <laughs> multiple personalities. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no city in the world like it. I think I can say that fairly confidently. Yeah. I've been travelled a lot, and it's 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 impossible to not get caught up in, especially as a first timer. It's intense, it's relentless, it's no, you know, balls to the wall, no holds barred. Everything that you want, you can find. Everything that you are, you will find a soulmate for it. It's all out there. And I, the brashness of it, it's, um, I can see how a lot of people don't like it. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you don't like, you know, confined spaces or big crowds on the sidewalk or people who'd speak too fast. But for me, it like tapped really deep into something and it exploded. And I was like, you're going to have to carry me out of a body bag if I ever leave this city. And I did that for six years, like 150%. I look back on it now and I'm like, oh, I could never do that now. But at the did time, it-, it was exactly where I needed to be because I, I had come out. I had a personal situation where I had felt a little bit insecure and not myself. Mm-hmm. And New York just like fired me out like a cannon. And I was just like, oh, I'm back, baby. Wow. So, yeah. and then in terms of, from a, um, a a market perspective, did you feel more competition in New York at all, or did, did you just feel feel more elevated work wise? Yeah, work wise. No, bec- and the good thing is because Al Jazeera was kind of operating on its own level. It's not competing with American Anyone. networks. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're not in a competition. We don't get scooped. We just it was fantastic because at that time it was we really set our own news agenda. If we thought a story was important, we did it. You we went in for it. Looking at ratings, we weren't looking at study groups or surveys. We just went. We, Al Jazeera think that's a good story. Let's do it. So we were on our own path. And actually, when we started when we started getting traction and credibility, we would turn up to stories, um, and then we'd go, oh, Al Jazeera, the new kids on the block, you know. And we had a lot of money at that point. Yes. So we were travelling yes. everywhere, we were going Fantastic. everywhere, and I was so proud to be able yeah. to say that because I was legitimately proud of being part of that, you know, brand. No, I remember when Al Jazeera first came to market, and I was a huge fan. I really loved it. Yeah. I really loved it. I will circle back on some of the events that you perhaps would have reported on throughout that time, but then. Post New York, you went what straight to London? No, just about. back to Sydney. <laughs> How was that? 
What was that like well, for a cultural um, shock? No, well, the thing is, I was burned out. Six years in New York, I was fried in every possible way. So how does Australia serve a purpose when you've been living the hardcore life in the LA's or the New York's and the London's? And of course, it depends on what you're doing because some mm. people might think LA's sleepy, but you know, that, that's just a facade because the sun's always shining, there are palm trees and lots of lovely hills in the beach. But really, it can be quite a crazy, chaotic city as well, yeah. energe energetically. Um, excuse me. <coughs> thank you. So, thank you. Um, yeah, so what was that like? Um, it was a big thud. I went back, I, I was ready to go back. Yeah, it was more like a downward wow. push. I went because I was I was genuinely homesick. I'd yeah. been gone for eight years. And New York, I was, as I said, and I'd stopped the hard partying. So I was like, I'm not enjoying a lot of what New York has to offer. Why am I here anymore? Like, you got to be noise... ready to be out there and absorbing yeah. the 24-7 culture of New York, yeah. no matter what you're doing, right? And the noise was starting to annoy me. Yeah. The dating was off. Everything was just like, oh, my God, I'm so <laughs> exhausted. Sydney said, yeah. like, get your shit together. <laughs> Come on, I've got the bottle of my Tinder pack again. <laughs> <laughs> now we've evolved on from Tinder, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so... Sydney seemed like this oasis in the desert, the perfect mm. tonic to what mm -hmm. I needed. And mm. my friends were there who I had been away from, and, my, and my, um, my dad and my sisters as well. So it, was, it seemed like the perfect answer. And yeah. I was, you know, um, approached by uh, an, my old network that I used to work for. So everything seemed to align. So I didn't mind going back, but it took about two months for me to double take and go, was this the right move? But did you find that energetically you just went? Mm. Yes, I found it. I found like, it super sleepy. Very sleepy. Like really, just you know what I? I mean, look, you're you, ahead of the so, energy. Whereas in New York and LA and other major cities, you have to keep up with yeah. the energy of the city. Whereas I feel like in Australia, you've at least got the opportunity to move at your own pace because the energy of the whole country and the, those cities <laughs> is kind of well, like a snail who's you know and, smokes and sativa. People don't aren't comfortable or they're not quite sure what to do if you've got too much energy in Australia. I mean, nowhere compares to New York, like I said, for energy. Yes. Like it just, it's just, yes. you can't possibly yeah. compare. But um, <clears throat> I did feel like I was checking myself and filtering myself even more um, when I arrived back in Australia. Back no one really wants to, to know understand. too much. They're just like, okay, you're back. All right, so where were we? Not, not my friends necessarily, but it's it's a very you know as you know it's, it's a generalisation, but I, I I totally understand. It's yeah. like you've been away for X amount of years. Aren't, aren't one of you going to ask at least one question about yeah. what's been going on the last five years? But there there is a block because I think a lot of people don't either know how to tap in or don't want to or and again that you know without um because we love australia it's our home yeah. country but there is that tall poppy syndrome issue that a lot of us have experienced definitely and i would say that every australian that's in america and other parts of the world would, would absolutely vouch for that yeah um yes i'm just gonna be careful with that and just say yes i agree i think we've all experienced it in different like a workplace with your friends um and it just depends who you're talking to in their own experiences of travel yes um how much you can and, and and i get it and i didn't at first and it was a bit it was a big big jolt yeah and a big shock um to realize that when i went back in many ways even like the supermarkets everything it's still 1995 there. <laughs> they think some things don't evolve. And you know what? That's what a lot of people love about it. Yes, exactly. And that's that, why that they're the there. things. Yeah, the um, reasons why we might leave are the reasons that exactly. keep everybody back there. For so sure. I get it. And the lifestyle is extraordinary. But I, it was just too much of a leap. It was yes. from this intensity yes. to go from that, plus career wise from Al Jazeera, but, to commercial yeah. station mm -hmm. in Sydney, literally at the opposite end of the world. But this opportunity granted you with a green card, and I don't mean granted, you obviously had to work really hard for this it. This one now. Yes, but yes. You, you most recently were awarded, granted your green card. I so was. congratulations, babe. Oh my babe. God. You in fact, no I was with idea. you when, you, when it yes. came through. Oh my God, mm -hmm. I really cried. Mm. I've been wanting that green card, well, pretty much since I was about 14 years old, mm -hmm. subconsciously, when I became obsessed with America. Yeah. Yes. But I applied for it before I left New York. Uh, and I was rejected, but I thought that I was going to move straight from New York to LA. It didn't happen, so I took the Sydney job, and then I went to London, and then I ended up. So it was just a bit of a scenic route: mm -hmm. <laughs> New York, Sydney, London, and yeah, yeah, LA. But, but the but green cut is huge. As a foreign correspondent, though, it's given you perspective over just Absolutely. international events. I mean, you've obviously had experience now reporting on some really significant and very large events that have been some of the biggest of our time. 
Um, you've reported on, I mean, the GFC, a lot of terror attacks out of Europe and the UK, the Boston bombings, Hurricane Sandy, yep. um, the BP uh, oil spill out of yeah. the Gulf of Mexico. So um, just to name a few, you've been around some biggies. So how does that, how has that informed your perspective on what it is you're going to be looking out for today in your career? What to report on from a subject matter standpoint? Yeah, interesting question because I've been, because I've always been a general assignment reporter. It means that I don't only do breaking news, but I can do entertainment, sports, and it's given me such a um, huge spectrum to draw upon in terms of now I know what gets me interested, what really gets a talk into me, um, what sort of stories, what sort of people. And for me, you know, it's such a cliche we say you're a storyteller. Um, there are gazillions of them walking the earth right now. But that is what I do. And the stories that always get me, and maybe it's because of my own background, um, are those that have involved some kind of challenge or obstacle or um, just incredible journey of, of discovery. And I think all my time traveling, when you see people who have nothing, no prospects, no future, but are really happy or fulfilled and content, um, or they don't have anything and they make it their life's mission to make to go somewhere else, to make something else of themselves. That sort of inspirational um, story really speaks to me. And then, because I've covered a lot of tragedies, seeing the strength of the human spirit. In the, I've seen, you know, I'm around, I've been around so much grief and um, hysteria and numbness of people in so much pain for so many reasons. Earthquakes, you know, natural disasters, terror attacks, school shootings. Um, and it's heartbreaking. And then that's when I think, oh my God, I've actually been quite lucky. But then to see those, the resilience in people, they're the kind of people that I'm drawn to. They're the one, ones I want to know more about. Mm -hmm. You've kind of answered some of my question there anyway, but I, I would like to still ask you, how have all those experiences uh, changed your perception of the world that we live in today? Um, and even having, over the last 20 years alone, how you have you seen things change for the, the better or worse? And how has that cha you know, uh, informed change within you as a human being and how you're able to show up to the world and, and the rest of humanity and the work that you're doing just as a human being in your day-to-day -day life? I think there have definitely been um, times, you know, more than five, when I have felt broken and I haven't been able to reconcile the evil that uh, people can, humans can inflict upon one another and the callousness and the heartlessness um, when I've thought, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why, why do I have to be witness to this? Um, I want to throw it all in. I want to go and, you know, work in a bar. I want to do something completely removed yeah. from this because I can't, you know, and it's not even happening to me. I'm just the spectator and I'm feeling like this. Um, so there are, you really see the face of evil in some things. Are you able to share perhaps one or two of the most disturbing or confronting experiences that you've had in your career to date? Yeah. What were they and sort of how did you deal with those situations at the time and, and, and time following? Um, I would say the two main ones that affected me the worst were the Sandy Hook school shooting and the Nice terror, truck terrorist. Yes, oh my God. Um, I think the Sandy Hook one was a watershed moment for the discussion around gun control and uh, you know, Second Amendment because they were kids and I was one of the first on the scene. And when we arrived, we, was, we were at the school and there were still parents arriving who had heard that something had happened but didn't know and they're yelling out their child's name, they're running towards the school because the police hadn't put up any cordons yet. So we were way too close. And I actually feel uncomfortable with that stuff. Like, I know it's our job to witness it, but I was like, <gasps> and then it was just, the news started filtering in and I had to go into a preservation mode for myself. So what I ended up doing the whole time, I was there for maybe seven, nine days straight and we were going round the clock. And I remember I was just getting information on my phone and repeating it and giving some opinion, but not engaging too much. Like I was going to the candlelight vigils talking to these parents and kids and people and I got through it and I just by going to bed just getting up what are the details what's new today what did Obama say what's Congress doing or not doing I factually <laughs> and then when I got back to New York afterwards um, and so by chance I saw the front page of the one of the dailies 
and it had the faces of all the all the kids on it and they were just what, six years old and I, ju- I absolutely lost it because that up until then they were just names and ages we know that so and so had a brother you can recite that you can force yourself but when I saw that I lost it and I had to I just started crying, started crying I couldn't stop and I called my boss and I said I, I need a break I need, I need to stand down but I was terrified that if I said that that they wouldn't send me again you know that they would go oh cat's a soft touch She's not going to cope with any other trauma. Better give her a break. But it's like, can I? It's, it's a human response, right? So that took a while. I had to work with my therapist. And then the niece terror attack was different because most when you go to most natural disaster scenes or terror attacks or anything, the police very quickly put up police tape. The media is sent back. Um, and there's a distance between you and what's happened. In Nice, uh, it was happened on the um, their Independence Day. Yes, I and was actually in Par- uh, yeah, I was in Paris at the time. Yeah, so the, you know the, the best, yes. yeah, it's a very emotional, patriotic day. And for some reason, there was no, they didn't do any, they didn't put any barriers up. And so, like the second day, you're walking along where the truck was, and you're seeing blood on the pavement. Someone died there. They and then. Actually, this was what triggered me. I, I, against perhaps my better judgment, I watched a video, uh, uncensored, of the truck hitting people, and I and hearing that. And it, it's it's the media's job to do that. Everyone who looks at that then decides: Do we censor that? Do we pixelate it? Do we mute it? You have to make a decision. But you see the raw footage. Anyone who looks at Syria gas attacks, it's our job to monitor that and see what is acceptable to the public. But we didn't have that filter. And after that one, um, I lost it at the um, when the mayor and uh, the president and the firefighters had a big rally, and these French men were like singing the French anthem with tears streaming down their face. Yes. And I just looked at them and I was like, "This is <laughs> yeah. really intense." Yeah. I got through that. The next day, I had to return the rental car in a hurry. I had to finish my file my last story to return the rental car, and I was so just like. I had a car crash. I, ba- oh, I wow, drove into babe. a concrete barrier. Nothing serious. The car was dented, and I just, I was, um, I just didn't realise because I was, like, no, nope, got to get the car back. Got to do it. Don't think about it. Again, I had to ring my boss, and that though, though, and and so, and he gave me a few days off, and I, you know, explored the south of France, which was stunning. But there was about what? So Boston, uh, Sandy Hook was 2012. This was 20, uh, 16. 20, yeah. That's four years. So that's four years between my, I would say, breakdowns. Um, and I think after Nice, and then Nice was this the beginning. I probably attended, I probably covered eight, ten more terror attacks after that, maybe more. And that's, I think, for the turn for me, that's when I started going, this is, I'm not, I, this is not enjoyable. Well, I mean, I, I know you well enough now to know that you are a very a beautiful and heartfelt, sensitive soul, but you're also a really, really strong woman. Um, and it is that fine balance between how to manage the career, stay relevant, stay um, in front, not be judged yeah. by perhaps male peers who are going to say, oh, she's too soft, she can't cope. Yeah. How do you, behind closed doors, and in your personal and, I guess, professional life, but behind closed doors, like, and you, and you did kind of touch on it, but really cope with those 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 moments either in the real time or what have you I mean how do you yeah I think what I learned from those um, is when I'm falling into a black hole um, I know I'm it's happening and I don't try and stop it and so what I've learned to do over the years is what I've got a circle of about four or five of my closest friends and I text them and I say um, not in a good space going to ground for a while we'll let you know and I come back for it and do I, you want them to reach out in those no, times? They no, absolutely I can't. Want to I can't talk about it. I don't want people to send me links to stories. I don't want to know anything about it. When I, and then I just lie down on the couch and I do anything but watch the news. Okay. And I cry and I just push through it. I know and I, it, it's it's part of the process because I have to heal myself it's before I go to the next detoxing. one. Yeah. It's if like you get the big... time, yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're given the time, but we had a six month period or four month period in London where there were back to back to back London Bridge, Westminster, Manchester, Grenfell Tower fire. Of te- there was no rest. So when I have the luxury of doing that, it's a matter of just, um, it's resetting. And I just taught myself to do it. I knew roughly how long it would last, what I needed to do. The biggest thing for me is I'm not afraid of it anymore. 
it's part of me and it's part of the way I choose to deal with it and I have to deal with it. Yes. Um, and that's healthy. Uh, so initially it was like, no, good. Because you, you can't go on camera with red eyes. You can't cry on air. It's not, you're not supposed to. It's a weird, you know, it's a weird thing that reporters People are supposed don't, to. People are not watching the news to see you be touched or moved by the situation. Right. They just want to see... Yeah. You're, you're reporting on it, right? Yeah, and I've seen people get slammed. The story, It's not about you. Just tell it, give us the facts, lady. Not me, but, you know, people who write blogs and then Cameron would just be like, oh, come on, honey. You know, it's not about you. You, you didn't get run over. Do you find that this has been and have you witnessed this to be a common sort of issue in foreign correspondence or any type of, you know, complex and um, confronting journalism with, with females in particular or would you say across the board? It's definitely common... What's not is that it's not spoken about very openly. I think as the world has changed um, around terror particularly, um, people are more cognizant of that reporters are on the front line mm -hmm. and we are seeing stuff. And you can you can turn off whenever you like. You don't have to listen what turn to watch the TV. You right. don't have to see the radio. Though. I can't. No. And the cameraman can't. They've got to film. They've got to work out what those shots are. Well, it's like any experience that happens to us, whether it's a car accident or whatever it might be, uh, an illness, we have you're we are the ones that have to recover from that. You're the one that has to recover from that. Yeah. You need the time, you need the downtime for yeah. healing. Yeah, but at the same time, it's also, honestly, I know a few, it's only a handful, some people are, are wired to just push through and they don't break. There is no vulnerability, there's no softness. Uh, I just mean all weak points of pressure where they will just back up, keep rolling. Yep, send me to the next one. When's my flight? Um, and while there was a time when I thought that was admirable, and to be honest, I was doing it for a while. It, it, well, for me, it wasn't sustainable. But there are people in the industry who can and do do it. What are they? What are they driven by? What are they hungry by for for them to be that type of human? Are they just not that adrenaline. empathic? Adrenaline. No, it's the it's the rush of going to something that's unfolding in front yes. of you. It's literally yes. witnessing like history. A, a different. Uh, erupting star, like yeah. pest, a volcano, like Anything, it's going to go yeah. in time. And, and what it's it, the unpredictability, yes. And having to react. And the ego part of it is going, I'm here to tell the world what's happening. Right. I alone, I'm the vehicle, I'm the messenger. Um, and that feeds into a lot of a lot of the ego of it as well. The on-air people, I mean, cameramen, you know, mm -hmm. they do off the pictures and because they do want to witness history, history too, and mm -hmm. be there to, to be a part of that. Um, and some people, that will never go away for them. It just won't. And that's that, and the, the industry does need those people too. You can't have people on, you know, emotional sick leave every two days. You can't. Right. It, the industry, and people want to get money, you know, bang for their buck, and they send you on a story. They need results. Through all these incredible experiences that you have, that have been incredibly enriching on so many different levels, what's been the the most enriching personal experience where you've just gone that has seriously changed me or impacted me for the better, or have you reported on something that has? really changed other people's lives and we will get to your documentary shortly but I should have thought about that before I came on here shouldn't I because... well too late <laughs> <laughs> you're reporting it now um, sorry the, well, oh, enriching I think look oh, I would say I wouldn't necessarily say it's necessarily enriching but it changed me Haiti changed me I've been to a lot of stories where I just it like just literally fills me up. But I think the one that I found most life changing that I, I couldn't forget for quite a while was when I went to Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, I was after the earthquake, yeah, wow. and there was an outbreak of cholera, mm -hmm. um, which is a very treatable disease. Yeah. If you know that it's treatable, and if you know how to get to a doctor, if there's a doctor nearby. Mm -hmm. um, but these people did resources. If you have yeah. the resources, they were already you know half a million people nearly died in the earthquake alone. Yeah. So structure, infrastructure facilities, resources were already depleted. And just seeing people die in tent hospitals. Um, and yet there was so much misery and there was, and I don't want to downplay that, but the spirit of the people was oh, wow. phenomenal. Wow. Um, and so that, that's, and, where and my, that's where the job takes you, these corners of the globe, that you would never know about, and to experience that in person was quite moving. Yeah, of course, and such a different culture from what mm. you were ordinarily accustomed to, necessarily, yeah. but to be immersed, you would have been there for a minute as well, right? Yeah, probably two, a, a couple of times in two and a bit weeks. Yeah. And after that, you really do feel like you're living yeah. in Iceland. Yeah. And one thing I'd love to bring to everybody's attention is the fact that you've won multi-awards for your own documentary, which you both produced and featured in, called So Close and So Far Away. Yeah. 
I did. Um, I made this when I was with Azura um, 2012. Um, and it, it, it started, uh, it's based off my own adoption and being part of Operation Babylift, was, which was a um, government operation run by the US and Australia to evacuate around 3,000 babies out of Vietnam before Saigon fell at the end of the war. Um, and so incredible, Kath. It is pretty crazy. I look back and it's almost like it didn't really happen to me. I mean, yes. I, was, I was a baby. I obviously have no memory of it. Sure. Um, and I was adopted by a white Australian family. Um, and then I went back to Vietnam in uh, 2003 and was very lucky to find my birth mother and extended family. So that was the premise of the document documentary. But the executive producer wanted to broaden it out to look at the legacy and the impact yes, um, 40 absolutely. years on <clears throat> Operation Babylift. Why was this story, I mean, aside from it being very much your own, why was this, and, and the mission of, of the EP, why was this such an important story for you to tell? Because you had to do so much unravelling. Yeah. Which I, must have been very confrontational. It was, I, I felt like I had a duty to myself to do it. Okay. I, I initially went into it thinking, well, I know my story, I found my mother, I'm just here to help the other orphans. You know, I've almost felt it was like um, something that I had the resources and capacity and platform to do. Uh, and I thought, I'll be fine, I'll, I'll be a reporter because, you know, as a reporter, I'm not supposed to have emotions, you're not supposed to know my personal story, you're supposed to see me, hear me, and then about the story I'm telling and make up your own mind about something else sure. that's not related to me. Yeah. But when we did the documentary, um, the first interview I did was with someone uh, from the CIA who was part of designing the operation. And I completely fell apart in the interview. I lost it because it, was, it just was like a knife in the heart. And I lost it on camera and the EP I know. kept... I know. I e saw it. <laughs> the EP kept rolling and then he eventually had to say stop. And we tried, I regathered myself, but after he said, after he said to himself, now we've got a documentary. Because he was worried that I was being too reporter, too, too standoffish. Yes, this was my life, and how, let's, let's check in on so and so and how they're coping. When really, my complete defenses fell apart in the first interview. And I was like, and I just went, you know what? Screw it, I'm in this all the way up to my neck. I guess I'm just gonna have to lay my guts out there. Well, I think that's where the strength in storytelling often resides, right? In, in complete vulnerability and transparency. Oh. <laughs> yeah, wanna cuddle up with me, microphone? Feeling I mean, a little lonely over there? <laughs> I mean, I'd do the same, you know, just jump. Sure. Take, take a nap, take a kip. Do what you need to Very do. Very boring. <laughs> um, Yes, so that was a very, very moving, moving story for, um, I mean, for anyone, right? I think there's a lot of people that we know mutually that have watched it and it's yeah. really deeply affected them for different reasons. I was particularly moved from the time that you um, connected with your Vietnamese mother right. and hugged. Yeah. Um, very, very moving. So how, how do you, where do you go from creating such a, a moving um, and cathartic piece mm. of content? What is what is that what is that whole experience and the documentary now mean to you today? Well, it's been a bit push pull because uh, I was exhausted from that making that documentary. I was so depleted. It took so much out of me, and I didn't expect it. I didn't think it would. Again, I thought I was going to be detached. So after that, uh, I kind of retreated back to my reporting demeanour and my personality. Um, the documentary was very well received. I was like, okay, it's clearly struck a chord and it's very powerful. People respond to it, as you say, for different reasons. But I, but I almost couldn't look at it again for quite a while because I was so drained. Um, but and now coming full circle from my career and seeing other people's pain and heartache and resilience and repair, as you say, that is where the best stories lie. And I think for myself, I'm now coming to the point in my career and, and personal life where I think it's important <coughs> to dig deep, go where it's uncomfortable, go where you want to run away. You know, stick a, stick a finger Bloody in that hard white though, isn't wound. It? But it's terrifying. Yes. Um, well, especially when it's your own life and journey, and especially when you've gone through gone through a journey and a set of experiences that you've been hiding from the rest yeah. of the world for so goddamn long, and to have to put those cards out on the table like you did 
uh, so charitably, so authentically, um, so meaningfully. Um, yeah, it's a really important journey um, and endeavour to take, as, definitely as part of the healing healing yeah. process as well. Yeah, and it's weird when you're doing it on publicly. You yes. know, we all look at reality TV and we know it's scripted. It's not, you know, but those genuine Kim, moments. Kim, Kardashian and <laughs> Cry. And sing. Um, <laughs> that's not, you know, my whole being and, and uh, career has been based on truth. But other people's truth. Yes. And it took a long time for me to come forward on my own. And I'm still working on that. And it's, there's so much to do with that. And that's why I think LA is, and where I am in my life, is the perfect place to be to try and unpack that. And I don't know if it's, if I, where it's going to take me or what realisations there might be, but I just think it's it's the right time. And I can look in my rear view and go, crap, I've, I've really had a great time. And I've been privileged and I've grown so much. But you know what? It's time for a sharp right turn. Well, it's a, it's a very healthy and fertile sort of ammunition for something. It's however you now choose to unfold your life, yourself and your career, as you're saying now here in LA, which is such an open, energetic landscape and such an incredible town for opportunities of all kinds in which you can really take by the balls and create and steer in whatever direction you wish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you mentioned earlier, and I can, can completely relate, and we definitely sh share this in common, which is your passion for America. And you said, like, by 14, you, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff. And, I mean, I've, I'm, I, I write, and I'm writing about that right now, about my aspirations to pursue my own version of my American dream or the yeah. American dream. What did it mean to you? What did it look to you, look like to you back then versus your experience now and today in DC, in New York, in, and now LA? Well, the first inkling I had of America really was um, through Sweet Dreams books. It's one of the best Sweet Dreams. Like the Sweet Valley High. Sweet Valley High, yeah. yeah. So they were the blonde yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was at a time when I was very um, confused about my identity. I didn't want to be Asian, I didn't want to be different. And then I saw a book which had an African American couple on the front. And I was like, oh, you're like, hang on. And I was like, I need to read this book. It's like, where is this? America? Yes. And I read a little bit about it. Didn't have the internet back in those days, not even dial up. So instead, I bought a, a picture of a map and I put it of the US. I put it next to my bed and I Aww. memorized all state, every Aww. single state in alphabetical order. Don't Aww. ask me to do it now. <laughs> but and action. And Alabama. No. <laughs> A a Alabama, that's it. But America. I Alabama. learned that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, coloured people can find love. Um, people who, they can be happy. They can be not judged on their skin colour. Oh, I wonder if there's anyone like me over there. And I just, and then I started watching NBA. And then I was convinced I was going to marry a black American basketballer. Could Listen, still happen, honey, not too late. <laughs> we all have. <laughs> Even my dad was like, you might meet someone. No, no, it's going to be black. He's going to be American. He's going to be basketball. So get your gift cards ready. Everybody. I know I'm still trying to convince my family that's going to be the case too. But uh, and it, so it just seemed like this land of opportunity to me, and where I could maybe fit in, mix in, blend in, not yeah. be a weirdo. But you found that in weird. New York, right? I found that in New York, but in DC was my first real experience say, of it. Of course, the exposure. Well, actually, Sydney was, to be honest. I grew up in a very small town of about twenty thousand people. And then when I went to Sydney, I was like, oh, hello, it's hello, Chinatown. Oh, 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 I'm not the only one. Oh, yeah. okay. So that progression. But then to me, when I first got to America, I was so taken with that and um, the ambition and the dream to be bigger. You know, in Australia, it's the opposite. We downplay our achievements. We don't want to be seen to be bragging. Or well, that's part of the tall poppy syndrome, the culture. syndrome epidemic, um, which you reference so, earlier. But I, I like the humility of Australians. Sure. But it also, when I remember when I first came here, and I would be, oh, no, that wasn't a big, and then, but, and then I'd be next to an American person who'd be overstating their abilities and achievements, yes. basically lying and yes. buffing up their CV, <laughs> and we're at the opposites. But over time, as I spent more time in America, and, and it was funny because when I moved back here, one of my very close friends says, why do you want to go to America? It's, you know, Trump's in power. Um, they don't have health care. They have people in school shootings. I said, yes, that is true. Every nation is flawed. But there is no other country I felt where you can arrive 
and you feel like anything's possible and there are people who will help you get there. I agree. If you have the right attitude. Here, here, 100%. And I love being around that. You know, sure, what do you want to do? How can I help you? Well done, babe. Good for you. Cheerleading you from the side. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in Australia, but as a culture, Americans are brought up, raised to believe, yes, American exceptionalism is an extreme version of that, um, but they have confidence, they're articulate, their education, everything is about being a better person and, and better culture. And I, that really attracts me. Awesome. So we had sort of touched on briefly about what does LA mean to you now yeah. today and what is it going to look like moving forward, having taken all the experience and perspective and where you've come, your whole journey, and you, you're now here in LA, two months in. Um, what are you hoping to unfold in the coming year and beyond? Oh, what does I, CAP look like in 2019, 2020 and beyond? I really just want to continue the storytelling part, but I don't, it doesn't have to be on camera. That's one thing, a good thing I've realised about myself. I don't actually care about being the voice. I, like, I want to be part of that creative process. Um, and it is about connecting with people who have had amazing journeys and experiences and failures and successes. And so I would love to be just part of whether it's documentary, whether it's um, correct scripted, or just part of, I love making shit. Like, you know, <laughs> whether it's on TV, on online, social media, I don't, but I'd also love those conversations yes, around it. I yes. know it sounds vague, but because it's so new, you know, I, I've spent the last 20 years of my career being factual. Black, white, no grey, sorry, you're either right or you're wrong and you're taking a left or right turn. So you've now kind and of got now, this like fluid, this, you know, just welcoming, being open and just yeah, seeing how... and just being open to that. And already in the two months since I've been here, I've met so many people by chance or by yes. design and they've all led been amazing, to right? incredible conversations, introductions, <laughs> possibilities, hello, <laughs> uh, here I am. Never like If I told you, you'd be sitting in a little studio with another fellow Aussie talking about your life. No, I won't. Who are we yeah. talking about? I love that part of it and I'm very open to it. I think if I'd moved to LA at any other time in my life or career, it wouldn't all have worked. All about timing, babe. All, all about, about that timing. timing. So it's a well, vague answer, but it's the most honest one. No, absolutely. And, you know, you, I, I mean, as someone that's been here for a minute, it totally will find you. I mean, timing's yeah. everything, but the opportunities, uh, things will fall out of the sky that you wouldn't have possibly dreamt of. Yeah. And life might might pivot and, you know, you name it. But um, so I guess I'd like to wrap up today's dialogue and we could obviously, you know, we could talk for hours. Um, what words of wisdom, uh, education, inspiration would you impart to those aspiring to a similar or related career yeah. as yourselves today? I mean, well, the first thing to say is that the industry has changed so much. You know, I'm the old guard of, of television um, and now it's all sort of online. Um, but I would say the, is have faith in yourself because I wasn't supposed to make it by normal standards because I wasn't white and because, you know, that was but seen You're so a... beautiful if you get to touch your skin <laughs> like I do. It's really yummy. I could just market that. I would have been straight to Katie Couric. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, it was like, you know what, you bastards, I'm going to prove you wrong. And so for me, it's all, I would say the advice is to back yourself, but also listen to other people. I wouldn't have got where I am without listening, but choose your mentors very wisely. Yes. Don't go with the ones who've got the most money, who's seen the fanciest. Go with the ones who've done the hard work. Go with people whose work you admire, you know, and seek them out and then just back yourself. And we work in an industry um, and we're sitting in a city that values looks and money and wealth and status. And at the beginning of it, already on this path, don't believe the hype. Yes, and just be your true just, authentic just self, you. right? And, and it, you know, yeah. you've got to make that yeah. happen. If there's one don't thing that apologize. I know, that, you know, yeah, every decision I've made has led me to the next one. And it's a lot of guts and, and, and to, sorry, believing my own gut um, and, and a combination of advice. But um, it's really tricky out there. I don't actually envy journalists coming up in the world because it's so competitive and cutthroat now. It's all about revenue. I think, it's I think, different. right, it's, yeah, changing. I mean, like everything. I, oh God, even in the short time I've been here, <coughs> excuse me, because I don't bring any water to the studio and don't let anyone else take a drink break either. Uh, <laughs> um, I cannot believe how quickly things grow, change, evolve. I mean, right. I'm not going to sit here and bore anyone because I'm no, not the one telling any corporate stories today, but 
things have changed. The, even the, you know, the business landscape has changed yeah. so much in five years, I can't believe it. Which um, means even more you've got to have such a strong sense of self and where, yes, you're, you do. where you're trying to go and what you want to do trust. and where you're, you know, exactly. You know, know who you are, you know, trust yourself, yeah. surround yourself by like-minded human beings. Exactly. End of story, just go from there and, you know, try and keep it real. Boom. Um, so where can everyone watch the, the documentary and where can they find you on social media? Hello, well, hi. Uh, <laughs> my documentary is on YouTube through Al Jazeera. Um, and most of my handles... And the name of it one more time. So far, so close away. And most of my media handles are Turner Scope. And that's T-U-R-N-E-R-S-C-O-P-E. Thanks for rolling the R's for our American <laughs> viewers. Because I, I usually have no F and idea what we're trying to say. Tuna. We're going to have subtitles on this interview <laughs> because... <laughs> Actions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyway, it was such a pleasure. Thank oh, you so much, thank Kath. You for Always me. incredible spending time with you and, and chatting to you about everything Love there that. is in life to talk about. And I look forward to seeing you again really soon. Thanks, Georgie. Thanks for watching Outlier TV. I'm Georgie Speakman. This is Kath Turner, and we'll see you again real soon. Adios.